Okay, we're going to be talking about the resolution of the vacuum catastrophe in this set of slides. It's a, it's a very complex problem, and it has some false ideas that have gotten in the way of interpreting uh, what is really happening and why do we really arrive at this type of discrepancy. But we'll get into all that as we go on with these slides. So the vacuum catastrophe, it's described as the worst theoretical prediction in the history of physics. There's 123 orders of magnitude difference between measured gravitational values of the vacuum energy density and the theoretical zero-point energy as correctly suggested by application of quantum field theory. I want to claim right here that the, this catastrophe is actually the most extreme example of cosmological fine-tuning. It actually proves that the universe resides within its own Schwarzschild radius, and it is this black hole okay, that permits continued existence because the black hole is in equilibrium. So, it's the most extreme example of cosmological fine-tuning. The universe resides within its own Schwarzschild radius, and this self-generated black hole permits the continued existence of everything. Okay, now Max Planck declared that all matter originates and exists only by virtue of a force, a single force, and that we must assume that behind this force there is the existence of a conscious and intelligent mind. Okay, now that's Max Planck. This video, okay, will examine where uh, gravitation and quantum mechanics meet and why we can't measure the interaction. We will calculate the vacuum catastrophe in energy terms, energy gravitational terms. We're going to discuss the unitary nature of the universe as a whole, and we are going to show how a single and extremely precise underlying fundamental force is at the root of everything we call reality. Uh, and also, we're going to elucidate how the vacuum catastrophe is the most extreme example of this cosmological fine-tuning. I want to start by proposing that increasing relativistic gravitational effects of a body or group of bodies augment the likelihood of quantum interactions occurring. And this is critical. Okay. And, of course, also true is that the emptier space is, the less likely it becomes to have quantum interactions occurring. To unveil the solution to this catastrophic discrepancy, we must first discuss the unitary nature of the force that is acting on the universe as a whole. Okay. We're going to have to examine this transcendent place where gravitational forces and quantum mechanics arise. Link interaction, we know that it's universal, and we also know that it exists within its own Schwarzschild radius. And the Schwarzschild radius of the Planck particle is two Planck lengths, or two de Broglie lengths. Okay, and this is where the quantum field and both general relativity and special relativity begin to meet. Now, it's effectively transcendent, and it's 20 orders of magnitude between our farthest ability to measure. Actually, it's 35 orders of magnitude. Going down to where the proton is, negative 15 meters, go even further, 20 orders of magnitude beyond that to 35. And we arrive at finally at the Planck interaction scale. Special relativity declares that when a particle approaches the speed of light, okay, then uh, it enters relativistic Lorentz space, okay, it's Relative time contracts or slows down, called dilation. Its curvature becomes much higher, smaller, as reflected in the Lorentz contraction, and its mass becomes greater. So in special relativity, as a particle approaches the velocity c, okay, it reaches the Planck mass, and it transforms into a Planckian black hole. And this occurs, relatively speaking, long before reaching the speed of light. But it does occur before reaching the speed of light. This is important to know. We note the relationship between uh, approaching the speed of light and approaching a black hole event horizon. You can see the, the relationship here between c squared and the Schwarzschild radius that I've pointed out. Falling particles on their final approach, before reaching the velocity c, they generate their own Planck interaction boundaries. Now, given that, the known birkenstein hawking black hole constant, the graviton's mass, and the trans planckian problem at the imaginary complex limits are all encountered at this point, one may deduce that this is exactly where gravitons are formed by the interaction. 
also from observations of an expanding and accelerating universe. The universal event horizon must be where these interactions most often occur. So the equation which stipulates uh, energy-gravity equilibrium when approaching the speed of light is the following. And you'll find here we have the uh, Birkingston Hawken constant, we have two Planck lengths squared, and we have the Schwarzschild de Broglie product. And they all are equal at 5.2242 times 10 to the negative 70 meter squared. Okay. Okay, so an accelerating particle or body of particles feels no force in free fall, and it begins to shrink as its energy increases. It approaches the Planck scale and ultimately becomes engulfed within its own black hole. And this happens most often at the universe event horizon. This holographic principle and the birkenstein hawking constant are how the equilibrium universe accounts for mass. And as shown both above and through the videos mentioned, this happens specifically through the graviton's mass. However, one's construction, in the end, the graviton is exclusively responsible for all gravitational attraction. Heisenberg superpositioning allows universal reach for the graviton alone. Okay, so this prevalence was achieved through the initial conditions of entanglement or superposition or Big Bang, and its unique form of generation remains within the Planck interaction radii. Okay, to appreciate this point, uh, it's necessary to view both the Graviton and the, uh, the Universal Equilibrium videos. Now, a complete Lorentz-affected time stoppage does not permit non-imaginary complex interactions, okay? But it will permit imaginary complex interactions. Therefore, entangled Graviton Heisenberg superpositioning remains available. In Birkenstein black hole expansion, the result, as pointed out here, reflects area, space squared, of the event horizon. No energy or mass are immediately involved. The graviton's mass value, being numerically equivalent through its de Broglie expansion value, contains information on the universal scale concerning both the location and equilibrium that a mass or particle retains within its dominion. So, in a semi-classical framework, the Planck interaction particle is on the force-giving side, directly generating any and all particles in the universe. Lorentz time squeeze does not permit reverse transplanking landscape transformations to occur. And I want to note that we have a factor of two in this, this equation here. And that factor is needed to yield the Planck length. And that is because the Planck interaction remains on the force giving side of the generation of any and all particles which are gravitonically generated. The Planck force immediately derived from the Planck interaction, okay, is on the force giving side and is directly involved in any and all particles. And it is seen as part of the direct force relation of general relativity in Einstein's field equations, Fp, the Planck force. Now the energy density of the vacuum includes two fundamental theories of physics, quantum field theory and general relativity. Uh, general relativity determines the energy density of the vacuum and it's determined by measuring the curvature of space-time using gravitational measurements, where zero gravity implies no curvature or Newtonian motion. The Planck particle is both complex and imaginary. For the Planck particle, two Planck lengths is the maximum continuous gravitational curvature possible. It's Schwarzschild radius. For that same complex imaginary Planck particle, the Planck length itself, okay, is the maximum continuous quantum curvature possible. It's de Broglie radius. The Planck mass is both transcendent and qualifies as a black hole. All black holes weigh the same amount per meter. This is valid to the Planck scale. And we have that at 6.733 times 10 to the 26 kilograms per meter. The Schwarzschild radius of the Planck mass is equal to two Planck lengths. And the black hole mass for the Planck length itself is one half of the Planck mass. And that is the zero point mass. 
Well, a vacuum catastrophe value can be calculated in various ways, depending on your starting. In order to compare apples to apples, we here will use the Planck RMS energy and its Schwarzschild radius of 2.5. 285 times 10 to the negative 35th meters against the equilibrium universe energy and its Schwarzschild radius as well of 6.733 times 10 to the 26 meters. By equals mc squared and the Planck RMS energy, we have the amount of joules 1.38 3, 2 times 10 to the 9th joules, and the vacuum energy, total density, gravitational density, uh, taken at its own Schwarzschild radius in meters cubed would be 1.584 times 10 to the 113 joules. Now, the equilibrium model, total universal energy, would be 4.074 times 10 to the 70th joules. The universal vacuum energy density, also taken at its Schwarzschild radius, would be the source of all gravitational curvature. And our result is 1.335 times 10 to the negative 10th joules. Now the ratio of the two values that taken in the earlier slide and this value would be 8.6782 times 10 to the 122nd joules. Almost exactly 123 orders of um, magnitude difference. And this represents the vacuum catastrophe in gravitational energy terms. Resolution of vacuum catastrophe brings along with it essentially two conceptual difficulties. And the first difficulty is the unit of measure itself. It's biased towards our own reference frame, the meter. And when we use the third power of the radius, you might expect that there's some kind of even spreading out of values over cubed distances and that would give some kind of constant relative values, and the math doesn't permit that because we're using the meter as the reference. So we see this great discrepancy showing up in that area. And the second, really the more crucial conceptual difficulty, is that the, the Planck interaction, the zero-point zone, is so completely below any possibility of measurements that it, you know, it's, it can't be detected, it can't be measured. We have to take it on blind faith. Uh, it's internal, it's physically transcendent, uh, cannot be detected or measured, and it's locked up in Lorentz relativistic black hole dynamics. And these two difficulties, in the end, are challenging. Now, shown below, we note that energy divided by distance equals force, and the resolution of component forces, multiple forces, results in the singular net force. Or, in other words, in a sum of many component vectors, one dimension alone is finally significant. So considering that the energy equivalence is exactly the same for the zero-point energy force value and the universal energy force value, we deduce immediately an extreme example of cosmological fine-tuning. This slide is actually pretty simple. The Vacuum catastrophe ratio in yellow is essentially equal to the universe to graviton mass ratio, which is in red. Okay, the de Broglie Schwarzschild product for any and all particles, galaxies, the Earth, the Sun, okay, that product between the Schwarzschild and de Broglie radii is equal to the Birkenstein Hawking black hole constant at 5.2242 times 10 to the negative 70th uh, meters squared. And this value is numerically equal to the graviton mass value in red. And I just point out here that the vacuum catastrophe ratio is equal to the universe to graviton mass ratio. Exactly. And uh, just another indication of this cosmological fine tuning that has occurred. So we have the internal and transcendent Planck force itself defines general relativity and quantum mechanics. And as shown in another video, however one calculates the vacuum catastrophe ratio, the equilibrium universe maintains unique component force resolution, yielding a singular net force, which is only possible within the confines of a universal black hole. Now, the Planck interaction, I've pointed out, lies at the center of the universe in terms of size comparison scaling. We find the Planck interaction at 10 to the negative 35th, 60 orders uh, from the maximum and 60 orders from the minimum. This Planck interaction is an internal 
yet transcendent interaction. And it's the singular, hidden, and internal source of universal equilibrium. So that's our video explaining a little bit better the resolution of the vacuum catastrophe. And all it really does is point to the Planck interaction and to the universal equilibrium. A very extreme example. Thank you very much for watching. I hope that you enjoyed this.